we're moving into some panel. I've got some pre-prepared questions and then we'll open the floor. And we've kind of divided the representation here so that you've got a department level agency, the institutional you know, government side of what's going on. You've got then, uh, I'm representing an office level view or a, a division level within the park service of how an agency is moving something forward. Uh, and then uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Atia Wells, who is executive director of Backyard Base Camp, a nonprofit community organization in Baltimore, and she'll get a chance to, um, well, actually I'll turn it because you're, uh, she's the one that you have not heard from yet. So, uh, so I am a registered nurse and the founder and executive director of Backyard Base Camp. Um, and what we do is we do urban environmental education. We're based in Baltimore City. We have taken 10 acres of congruent vacant land and turned it into a community farm. We also steward a seven acre um, abandoned park uh, where we created a trail system for our community. Um, and we utilize this space to provide education to our community members, schools around us, we have chickens, goats, sheep on our farm. Um, and we also provide a continuum of programs that include summer camps. We do a workforce development program. Um, and our goal is to really train up our next generation of environmental stewards to come directly from our community and replace us in this work. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. Great, thanks, Atia. Uh, okay, so we'll jump into the first question. Uh, thinking about your perspective roles within your organizations, uh, how do organizations and agencies begin moving towards a more inclusive and equitable engagement? And like my presentation was um, just a minute ago, I think we have to start with data. Um, and data is important because we have these kind of imagined notions of the way either uh, organizations, people, or communities are. And so when we can begin to actually use data, it begins to paint a different picture for us. And so I live in Baltimore. And so I am clear about what my friends and family think about Baltimore. But if you are actually there on the ground experiencing it, or you take a look at it statistically, it is very different. And so therefore the organizations there should be looked at differently. Uh, so there's a reason why, for example, Westmore, the governor, is in Baltimore a lot. Baltimore is the most populous city in, in the state of Maryland. If you want votes, you need to be there. So regardless of what you think about Baltimore in terms of it being a black city or it being crime ridden or it not having organizations that can actually take care of the city, um, that's not true. There's some other statistics about it that are real. Uh, that should be used to actually inform the way in which we go about um, doing work with and for um, organizations that are there, um, whether you're the federal government, um, state government, or um, local government. Um, well, for us, little minions down at the street level, um, I think what we do is utilize the data that comes from uh, local and um, federal governments to really get on the ground and moving. I recently read that black people in underserved communities are the most like researched population um, in the country. And so there is a lot of data out there and the way that we utilize that, um, that data that comes from above. And then we also do community engagement with our neighbors. And that looks like door knocking, asking them questions like, is this, does this ring true to you? What are you wanting to see in this space? What do you want from us as an organization? And, um, I worked for the feds for a little bit and I felt, I always felt like at some point we need to just stop talking about it and be about it. Uh, there needs to be action. That's what moving, moving is an action. Um, and so doing things, understanding that you may fail, um, but use it as a learning opportunity. Take what you got from that. Um, you know, apologize if you need to and continue moving forward and keep going. I feel like a lot of people don't start because they are afraid to fail or they believe that nobody's gonna want what they have to offer. But if you haven't even, you know, made the suggestion or even asked the question, then how would you know? Yeah, I think there is a comfort in uh, being in the planning phase because you can always you know, say, oh, well, we're still working it out. We're still figuring it out. You know, somebody asked a question, oh, well, we just haven't gotten to that place yet, but we do need to get to a point where we write it down, we put it up on a website, we, we put an, an initiative name on it, and then we, we, we got to jump in and, and see how those moving parts go. You know, I think on our end, uh, there is some data involved as well, but data for us also is in the form of feedback. Uh, the grants 
the need that we documented in the first year, we've got we got almost ten million dollars in requests that first year. So that's not just somebody writing down a proposal. That's somebody raising their hand and saying we have a need, and we're willing to go through the hoops to quantify that need into a proposal. It's unfortunate that you know we, budgets are the way we are. We have to prioritize, but that doesn't discount that somebody raised their hand and uh, identified a need for us. And now it is up to us to see how that need works in uh, to our game plans in order to be more inclusive and equitable. So with that in mind and with your references to data, what do you think are the biggest obstacles then to try to uh, push the needle uh, either within your organization or things that you've seen? Obstacles for us come at different levels. So like at the community level, there are obstacles in like engaging with our community and, you know, trying to do something for all people, which doesn't never ever typically works. Um, and then understanding that like the folks who we are working with don't necessarily care about the environment yet, or maybe they do, but they just don't have the socioeconomic status to really like think about leisure and like go and have the time to go on a hike when they got bills to pay. Um, and so we like, are trying to sort of bring them into something that they have never really been exposed to. Um, and then at the city government level, I always say we'll cross that bridge or burn it when it comes to it. Um, I'm of the faction of burning the bridge. Um, I do first and apologize later, yes. <laughs> um, and so just the red tape of trying to do what we know needs to be done and also understanding that there are processes and meetings, the pre-meetings, the intra-meetings, the post-meetings. Um, I'm not excited to be a part of that. Like I really just wanna do what I need to do and then you figure out what you need to do in order to make me what I'm trying to do happen. Um, and then we'll meet somewhere in the middle or not. Um, and then a lot of the obstacles come with funding. Like as a new and emerging organization, we're only about like four and a half years old. Um, I, like I said, was a nurse before I came to this. I would, didn't have any sort of formal education in business management, nonprofit management, none of that. I'm basically learning on the job. Um, and, you know, understanding how to talk to funders. I know my first, um, my first conversation I had with the funder, I had like my little pitch and I sent it to a program officer and she read it and she was like, I'm very frank with you you can say black people <laughs> you don't have to say minorities and you don't have to use all these terms that you think people want to hear and that really sort of strengthened my resolve and understanding that i can be my authentic self and talk the way that i talk and be who i am regardless of who i'm talking to <clears throat> yeah that, that that's pretty powerful uh, <laughs> um so i think for say the federal government i think there's a there's three things that uh, I'm going to say so one is capacity and so sometimes there's just not the capacity to do uh, that work and so and it's sometimes mission related right it's where the resources flow so as a federal land management agency you are tasked to actually deal with protecting the resource and then there are other monies that flow in as well that do some of the other kind of engagement work and they're not often funded at the same level and so that creates a bit of a gap where it looks like from the outside, you're really just trying to maintain the status quo and you're deaf to uh, the people element. Uh, but sometimes it's a resource issue. Um, I think then permission. Um, so having permission to actually do this kind of work um, is important as well because sometimes folks don't see the second part of the mission statement of the National Park Service. So they get the first sentence, preserve unimpaired for future generations. And so folks can say that all day long. But the second sentence says how to do that, and that is through partnerships. It actually talks about recreation. It talks about community assistance. And so those components become important as well. Uh, the, the third piece for me is political will. Uh, sometimes there is not political will with the federal government. And so your hands are tied. So as much as you can see this, the right thing to do, um, you can see where the need is. Uh, you may have a partnership. Uh, there's not a political will to actually make that happen. I think all three of those things are in play right now and in a positive way to actually move forward, which is why I'm excited about the moment we're in right now. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna extend the capacity comment as well from our side as an office. Um, 
where it's not just the capacity to do this work, but it's the capacity to navigate the administrative processes that get you to do more work. You know, I represent granting for the federal government now, so I had to learn all the rules that we are beholden to as a, 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 a granting agency that are placed on us. If everybody has to use grants.gov, I need to figure out how to make grants.gov as easy to navigate as possible because I have no way of changing that as an entry point to applying for a grant. Uh, but there's a lot of steps that people need to get to uh, to get to that point of understanding these are things they need to learn because I can't do anything about helping them you know, through a back channel. There is no back channel. Uh, and there were some examples where folks would ask us questions about the granting process, and I had to be very honest with them that based on the question they were asking me, I really didn't see that they understood how this works. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't a, a, a comment on the project or the need. It was just, you know, there's some steps we're going to need to work on. Thank you for letting me know. Now I need to know, uh, you know, maybe add one or two more webinars next year. But the point is that we need to be listening to that and not just discount it and say, here's the help desk or here's the website. You're going to have to figure it out because everybody else has figured it out. Our, I feel like our job as an office is what is that next level of customer service? What is that next level of capacity building? Um, because this, we're not in a situation, I've said this before in some of our webinars, we're not in a situation where if we build it, they will come. If we build it, we can sit back and you know probably have met our expectations, but the point is the utility. The point is that these websites, that the people submit applications, that we get projects to consider. So we need to think about what that next step is uh, and address those capacity uh, gaps. Uh, okay, last question before we turn it over to the floor is, uh, within your world, can you um, think of a, a good case example that you it really jazzes you up when you think about it as something that you have loved to have seen that reflects what, what we're doing here, what we're talking about? So, in, in preparing for today, I, I took a look at some examples. And so, uh, there's an example with the Anacostia Watershed, uh, so Anacostia Park in Washington, uh, D.C., um, which is an, an environmental justice um, a river, really. Um, and so there, over the past year, uh, the superintendent, Tara Morrison, worked with the Department of the Interior's um, Environmental Justice Program to hire local high school youth um, from wards, I think, seven and eight. Um, and so if you don't know what those are, those are, the, those are where the black people live. And they tend to be um, disadvantaged communities. And so they don't quite, they're impacted by the river, but they don't quite have a way of actually doing anything about it. And so the program empowered them to learn about the river, um, become river stewards, and then to work with the University of the District of Columbia, which is a HBCU. Um, and so the students, so there were African American high school students who could actually see themselves in the HBCU students, so the historically black college and university students, and really chart a course for this could be real for me. This could be something I can work on, get a degree in, and get uh, a job in as well. And it kind of changed their mindsets. You could see some uh, some light bulbs go on, and you could actually see um, a pride in community and where they lived um, and, and were working um, actually happen for them. And for the first time, they were connected to the community that they lived, went to school in, and or worked, and they weren't just impacted by it. Um, I think for us, we would be that example of a success from like turning this vacant and unused land into a true community gym in green space and then consistently offering programs that people actually care about and actually want to come to. Um, and then, like I said earlier, providing that continuum of programs um, where, you know, we start with kids who are three years old um, and, you know, now they come to summer camp every year and then they get into our workforce development program. Um, we have one or oh, two success stories. Actually, one um, was one of our summer camp interns who came to us as a youth worker. He went through our professional development program. He came back the next summer as a summer camp educator, and now he's trying to come back to actually lead the workforce development program. Um, and then one of our other workforce development um, 
workforce development program participants is currently our outreach and volunteer coordinator. And so we're like building this pipeline of black and brown youth that come from Baltimore City. We're meeting people where they are. We're not saying like, hey, I'm gonna take you out of your community and bring you to West Virginia, no offense, um, <laughs> and show you, you know, what the wilderness looks like. And it's a place that you may never come to again. Um, I'm gonna show you, you know, what's in what's the good that's in your hood like akima price says um the good that's in your hood and um you know how to take care of it how to steward it and then you know use utilizing that as a jumping off point into you know maybe you eventually getting to west virginia to attend a training here um and i always say like i don't care what um what major our kids choose when they you know become when they go to college or even if they do go to college or don't go to college but i just want them to think about the environment and look at things towards an eye of sustainability um and i have an example of myself as a nurse when i was like feeding a baby and i threw the bottle away um and i was like how many bottles am i throwing away per 12 hour shift this is ridiculous um and so i started a like a green club at our hospital to figure out how I, how we will recycle all of this hospital waste that um that we've been using long story i know that was great um and, and then from our lens i think the the success that i see uh from the work that we do is you know because a lot of our work is admit, more on the administrative side the fact that we had three grantees in this group of 22 that had never received a federal grant before you know that says some i don't know if it was because of a webinar we did or some you know uh, the checklist that we put together but for whatever reason we can count that we have we've added three people to this community of folks that now know how to navigate federal grants uh so you know i would be looking at those kinds of uh stories to be able you know a year from now these 22 grantees it's going to be a bring a friend kind of thing every time we have an application you've already done it bring a friend to the rfp and and make sure that they have the ability to to apply so um thank you first question is from jonathan jonathan wants to know what data is there on the current demographics of current entry level and early career employees working the frontline jobs whether that be nps or the state level and then also noting it would be an interesting way to look at those numbers you know and then see whether the changes are beginning um, to percolate in the each of the systems all right jonathan so there are data sources that uh, in the national park service i'll use that as an example so rita moss the associate director of workforce has brought in <clears throat> excuse me different systems where she is accounting for um, recruitment retention and then um, when folks actually leave and so we are beginning to have data sets to understand at each a point of engagement with an employee, uh, what is actually happening, uh, happening, and then ways in which we can actually correct for that. And so that data exists. Uh, it exists online, I do believe. If it's not online for the American public, it is online for uh, NPS, um, executive management, to be able to make decisions based on that. And so that's brand new. Okay, and then I also, not a question, but more of an acknowledgement. So the phrase, nothing about us without us, is actually used by the disability rights and advocacy community. So thank you, Dr. Derek Cogburn, for acknowledging that and reminding us. And then a question that came from Holly is, based on the most recent comment from Reggie, what what then is the lobbyist position to equalize monetary atonement for further people capacity? So the money between conservation slash outdoor versus cultural resource management, historical people proposals. So I think I get it. It is the, the idea, how do we balance uh, the balance sheet of the park service really, or department of the interior to make sure that monies are flowing out uh, across um, different program areas. So, so this is interesting, right? So and I'm going to say some stuff that is probably not going to sound easy or popular. So the first thing, the word lobbying was used, I think it was. And so that's a real thing. Uh, that is a real thing where outside communities, uh, outside advocates are listened to um, by their congressmen, uh, congresswomen and senators. And so they want to hear from constituencies to say, hey, um, invest here. We want more <clears throat> community assistance work. And I'll give you an example for our Rivers Trails Conservation Assistance Program, so RTCA. Um, and so it's the program that uh, works outside a park to work with communities. 
there is an advocacy group for that um, for that program, uh, and I um, was in. I supervised the program for three years. Um, it that advocacy group was um, impactful in being able to get a million a million dollar increase in the budget in one fiscal year. If you know anything about the federal budget, that is monumental to actually move a million dollars into a program and then be able to impact uh, impact it. And so it is from the outside that can actually have results inward. But the folks on the inside need to be doing the work as well, because what that means then if the say National Park Service, for example, has a $3 billion budget, that $3 billion is set. And so that new $1 million when it came in, it there was actually no new money that year. And so the million dollars had to kind of be subtracted from somewhere else in order to actually be in the place that Congress wanted it to, uh, to live for that fiscal year. And so there's some inner workings that we have to do as well to get the equity piece correct from program to program. Um, I think finally is being able to understand the budget process. If you're a program manager or you're a staff member um, that's in charge of, of resources, if you are not paying attention to the budget cycle, right now you are, we are working on FY26. So if you're trying to talk about FY24 or 25, you've already missed the cycle. And so you've got to understand internally how things work so you can be the advocate on the inside as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also Thomas dropped a link to RTCA in the chat. Um, last question from the chat is from Jonathan again. Um, how do we best hold up and showcase examples of real change taking place through examples like the one in Anacostia, but do it in a way that it seems like a movement rather than just a success? Uh, well, I'll take that uh, just because of the, the grant program uh, or our grants. One of the things that we now will be uh, having is every year these grantees then move into best practice or lessons learned or, uh, you know, models for engagement. Each one of them represents some uh, actionable thing that made made it through merit review and now will get implemented. And we want to be able to go back and start building this library. This training will be a component of that as well. This is planned to be an annual or some regular with some regulatory regular uh, convening in order to showcase those examples. Uh, I did also want to go back to the data question that if you are an organization that works with specific types of data and you would like use of that data or the things that you're getting from that data to be more widely known, let us know and we'd love to be the platform that gets you in front of the watershed. Uh, to uh, help make that understanding for folks that might not be working in that world. Thanks. Um, I have a question about leadership and whether that's your board and the memberships of your board, whether that's um, leadership um, in thought leaders, but really a question of, you know, a lot of our partners across the watershed reflect the conservation industry, which is largely white um, and evolving. But could you share some thoughts or ideas or, or, or best practices in bringing in more diversity, bringing in, you know, black leaders, Latino leaders, um, BIPOC, leaders into whichever space is missing. Yeah, I can speak to that clearly because we have a board. I don't think y'all have a board. Do you have a board? This is news to me. Okay, um, so um, being that we're a community-based organization, we are reflective of the community that we live in. Um, I would say for folks who are not uh, in that space, what I've seen done that has worked really well is creating an advisory board that is made up of community members and paying those members for their time. I've also seen, um, you know, some folks sort of, um, oh shoot, I lost my thought, oh no. Um, advisory boards, community boards, oh, um, so some folks have been changing their bylaws because there are a lot of nonprofit organizations who mainly use their boards to fundraise 
we don't do that. Our board members really drive our strategy. They are not a fundraising board. That is the work of me as the executive director and our development staff. Um, and also getting rid of, if they have it in their bylaws, that your board members need to be donating money. Our community ain't got money like that. And so to, what they do have is time, they have expertise, they have lived experience. That is what we want to pull from them, not the dollars that they need to use to keep their lights on. Um, and I definitely believe that in that same vein, sometimes I've seen organizations sort of walk this fine line of tokenism where it's like, oh, this is the person who is like always speaking. Let's make sure that they are invited to the table and then they get like Reggie where they're invited to be on every single thing. Um, so really just taking um, maybe doing some more listening sessions, seeing who's coming to the meetings and then developing your advisory board out of that. And also, I would say, remember to also utilize the youth of your community. Youth can also serve on advisory boards. They can also be board members. Um, but that's always a voice and a face that I always find missing in these spaces is I'm like, where are the kids at? Um, so yeah, I think um, those are those are my my answers. Yeah, I come from the nonprofit side before I started here, and so the, the, a lot of that resonates. Where you know we on various boards we were on, if it's hard to start talking about a target community and look at our board and know that we've got nobody representing that community on our board, so you're already going to be missing a, a key part, a variable in, in figuring that out. Uh, but I also see the question in in two parts. There's helping communities do the gap analysis so that they can create, uh, find where their gaps are. And then there's helping them with the strategies to address the gaps. So within our office, I feel like we will have, uh, we want to be at a point where we should be assisting on both sides. And a community re really, they just, or an organization just needs to raise their hand uh, and say that they, they need help in, in one of the two aspects. So that's what I'm hoping that, that uh, folks will see more coming out of our office from. Another question from the floor? From and the chat. One more online. All right. Um, yeah, a chat, and then William has a question. Um, so this is from Angela. Angela is a community engagement coordinator in uh, focusing on the Baltimore area, working for the National Park Service. And the question is to both DOI, NPS, and community organizations, how do you, which I think is gateways, um, see yourself interacting with NPS communities in ways that impact the overall vision? Uh, you know, I think the easy answer for us is that there's a dynamic that uh, a dynamic and a will that would be reflected at the community level. It's where can then we bring resources and guidance to uh, augment or uh, amplify, um, or in some cases establish a plan. Uh, the space that we've uh, done a lot of great work in is on the planning side, where there's money that people can get for implementation, but a lot of times you're missing the the planning phase. So that's a space that I think we can uh, occupy and get them into that level of sophistication to go after the money. So, I mean, I think that's a, an area that I, I see us uh, uh, conveying for these communities at the, uh, to, uh, the office level. And we thank you. We are also uh, going to be rolling out a new Gateways Communities Initiative, which is really going to be looking at collaborative decision making, uh, where we're going to be providing guidances for communities of various different uh, scales. So we're, we're kind of gaming out what a community collaboration might look like. Some might be municipality based, might some might be a collection of municipalities, and some might be a community that hasn't really come together as uh, a, a structured, um, it, with a structured infrastructure, but they're putting all the pieces together. So we want to have this program provide guidance for all the different scenarios that we might be walking in. And if you come to our session tomorrow, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Thanks, Linda. All right. Um, so I did have a question in terms of earlier when Eddie was mentioning, I guess, working within the, for example, you got certain applications and you could tell from the questions that they were at asking that they weren't ready to manage that grant. I think that one thing that's important to consider is that a lot of the rules and processes in place were meant for specific people and that it isn't necessarily conducive towards equitable and inclusive engagement. So this question, I guess, would pr um, 
be more for Atia. How do you find that process and those, like, I guess, rules and things that you have to do to get a grant? Do you think that there are other ways uh, that could be <laughs> better? And like, do you have any ideas on how that could be improved? I found the process to be, if I can be frank, excuse me, my French, it was a pain in the ass. I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. <laughs> All right. Um, Grants.gov is not user friendly. I don't know who designed that. Fire them, please. Um, there were a lot of pieces. It took a lot of work um, and, you know, just all the attachments and the and then even afterwards we got the award notice and I was like did we really get this because then there was a sentence that said this does not mean you got an award and I was like but you just said I got the award um and so um and then sort of the back and forth and all that and it's like can you you're, you're 40 cent under can you just change this budget so that it matches that it has to be to the penny and I was like are you kidding me um ways to ways to make it better I I don't, I don't fucking know. Um, I think, <laughs> just, just burn it down. Um, I think that webinars definitely help. Um, and I don't know like how deeply or what y'all's capacity is for doing webinars, but just like, you know, going through the application questions, um, making sure that folks are understanding the questions that are being asked. Um, making, why is the budget narrative have to be a Word document? Why can't it be an Excel spreadsheet? Because like I can do my formulas and stuff and then I like miss my math on one thing and that's why I was 40 cent under and over. But anyway, like, you know, having some sort of friendly document that's not a word document who does that anymore. Because, um, you know, you have the SF 424 that does all the calculations. So why I got see, see, don't get me. You don't got me started. Um, <laughs> but yes, I definitely think. Um, like better templates, maybe in grants.gov where we're just inputting the information into that interface versus uploading documents, unless there's something specific that you need, like a, an organization budget um, may be helpful. Um, and I haven't gotten to managing the thing yet, so I'm sure I'll have more to say when that comes around. Yeah, I think the hard part is that we're all bound by these systems across the whole federal government. So every year, you know, we hope to add more uh, technical assistance into the process that we can be providing. Uh, but it also highlights that, you know, federal government, federal sources should not be the only things available to communities. Uh, there is a big move towards interview based applications where you're able to just sit down. Uh, you know, there we, you, you, we do have to be careful because there is a workflow to this work. Uh, a lot of folks will come with passion and, you know, they want to do something, but this is an exchange of funds. There's an expectation for deliverables. There's reports. Uh, so you can't go into it totally uh, blind to the administrative component of it, but the entry point shouldn't be so overly burdened that, it, that it, it's a locked door. Uh, and I think any funder, whether you're federal or uh, from uh, private philanthropy, that is something that we should be challenging ourselves. Uh, if it's one system, we need to break down the next level of customer service to deal with that one system. And there's also multiple systems. So there's the grants.gov and then there's ASAP and then there's another one that you Eight also, codes. yeah, that you also need to be registered in. And yeah, there, it's a lot. Thanks for the checklist. It's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> so recently I just finished um, reviewing some grants for the National Park Foundation. And so um, my office is the liaison to uh, the foundation. And so and I'm not saying this is you, Atia, um, but there is like there's some well-known, say, figures, say, in the environmental movement who are people of color. And so they put in an application and it wasn't complete. It was just it was like, y'all know who I am. Y'all know I need the money. Um, so here's here's the application and it didn't meet the mark. And so I know that when those folks get that back, there is going to be a backlash all of a sudden. And all the public is going to see is the National Park Service, the National Park Foundation did not fund this popular BIPOC group. Why is that you're perpetuating um, structural racism? Just the whole thing is just going to all of a sudden cascade down. And we can't get to the point of 
the application was substandard, incomplete, and non-compliant. And so there's a flip side to actually uh, understanding the culture and us actually making it easier. It's also that there's you've got to follow the system. Um, it's, it's the same as in sports. If you want to play baseball, there's a way to actually do the mechanics of baseball. <laughs> there's a way to actually wear the uniform, hold the bat. There's a certain things that you've got to do. And so you don't get a pass um, just because you're the most vocal voice or you put pressure on an organization for inclusion. So just a little flip side of some of the stuff that we're beginning to see as well. Thanks, Reggie. And I will offer that we are the division, we are the office that is set up to be that uh, entry point to help with that. So if there's things that we can't, that we got to all work with uh, and you see a need, let us know. And as best as we can, we'll come up with training. We'll come up with additional resources. So I know we've run over. We're going to do one more question uh, and then close. If there's uh, another from the floor. There's one online. Right, do we have anything online? Not questions, but I think some helpful comments is Atia, people feel you on Grand Stock Up. So gang, gang. there's some confirmation on that. Um, also, uh, comments about how the network chats, the network chats were so helpful. Um, there was a little bit of a laughable moment that the checklist was six pages, but it ended up being a great resource at the end. And then, um, yeah, um, a lot of no. folks said that there, then the network chats were very um, helpful and that Eddie saved saved them. <laughs> um, but then there's also um, the webinars, I guess, for future reference uh, should address technical language and how they can be used and, and expected. Great, good to know. Okay, yes, yeah, so we definitely know there is more uh, on the customer service side, on the technical assistance side uh, to make these resources more accept, uh, accessible and it's good that we have very frank feedback, folks that were willing to give us frank feedback. So um, uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap there. I do wanna thank Reggie and Atia for joining us. So uh, please uh, help me uh, give them a nice round.